welcome everyone who is uh, in, in the chat so far and everyone who's, uh, who's trickling in to this, uh, the first, uh, first round of breakout sessions, we are looking at agribusiness in Africa. Uh, most specifically, the title is Separating Hype and Reality. Uh, by way of a quick introduction, my name is Lamri Akinola. I'm the editor of something called Namara. I'm going to be uh, acting as referee this morning. And uh, on screen with me are Ellen Rasmussen, who is uh, Executive Vice President for Scalable Enterprises at Norfund, that is the Norwegian Development Finance Institution. Lyra Sorensen Holm, who is a uh, CSR and Communications Manager at Tom's Group in Denmark. And uh, not on video, but with us on screen, we have Dankwa Ado Yobo, who is West Africa Regional Director for Yara International, which is, of course, a big Norwegian agribusiness firm. Now, if you know anything about agriculture in Africa, you know that it is a story of tremendous potential. Uh, the World Bank estimates that African food markets fully realized could be worth a trillion dollars. Uh, it's a trillion dollar economic opportunity. And uh, you'll often hear that Africa is home to 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. And, uh, you know, depending on who you speak to, people will, will tell you that if Africa scales up its agriculture sector, it could not just feed itself, but basically become a major supplier of uh, food to the world, a major exporter of food. That's the story. That's the potential. Um, the reality is a little bit more tricky. And this year in particular has really underlined that uh, the agribusiness sector and the agriculture sector has a long way to go on the continent. Very quickly, just a couple of statistics to, to set the scene before we get into the discussion. But uh, earlier this year, the World Bank warned that uh, the continent could see a 7% reduction in output due to the pandemic. Uh, and that is contributing to already rising hunger levels, not just globally, but particularly in Africa, where the UN estimates that 31% of, uh, of the population globally suffering from hunger is located. Now, it's a re you know, that's sort of been a wake-up call, um, but the issues were there before the pandemic. The pandemic has really amplified things. So uh, just a few numbers. Uh, the, the FAO, that's the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, estimates that 20% of Africa's population is malnourished. That number has increased significantly in recent years. Uh, the food import bill annually now stands at 50 billion. The estimate is that's going to more than double to 110 billion in the next five years. And spending on agriculture by governments has actually gone down as a share of budget allocations from around 3.6% in 2001 to 2.3% in 2017. There are many more numbers. I'll leave it there for now. Um, the point is that um, this doesn't really, this jars a little bit with a lot of the rhetoric we've heard over the last 10 or 15 years. There's been a lot of talk about the potential of African agriculture and a lot of promise, to be frank about it, especially in the last five or 10 years. We had the period of Africa rising when we saw, saw strong GDP across the continent, and that went hand in hand with this talk of a green revolution. Things have gone a little bit quiet in recent years. So what the, my challenge to the, to the speakers today is to try and take stock and really put our finger on the pulse of, so where are we? Um, and how do we now start getting beyond talking about this revolution in African agriculture? And when do we start to see real solid evidence that systemically we are moving in the right direction? Okay, that's all from me for now. I'm hoping that, uh, by this point, Dankwa, you are with us. Can you hear me? I'd yes. Like to come to you yeah. first. Okay, excellent, Dankwa. Now, I <laughs> want to come to you first because I think that uh, your perspective uh, from, uh, from, from Yara is a good one here. Yara has been very heavily involved in, you know, in pushing the agribusiness agenda in Africa for quite, for quite a number of years, you know, both in terms of trying to scale up uh, agriculture, working very closely with governments, but also working a lot on trying to get uh, more private sector participation and bringing the two sides together if you want, so public and private sector. Um, now, it would be great to get a, a sense from you of, you know, like what, what would, if you, if you were challenged to say, give us a progress report, uh, what would you say? Are we, are we making enough progress here with agriculture? Are you satisfied? Um, what, what do you think needs to happen? And, you know, like, and I'll give you like a couple of minutes and please also just give a, use it as an opportunity to quickly introduce yourself and if you want to highlight any specific issues. Okay, so my name is Dankwa Adubu. Um, I'm the West Africa Regional Director for Yara. 
It's a shame that my camera is suddenly not working because I tested. I would really love to put a face to this. But um, so I'm responsible for our business in, in West Africa and also directly managing the dam. So coming back to the question, have we made enough progress? I think the big word in the question is enough, whether we've made enough progress. I know it's some good progress in uh, important areas, and maybe I just made three of them back to my thoughts as in whether that's enough or not. Right. On the, if I take the FTMA, the Farm to Market Alliance that was built in East Africa, it's a complete value chain uh, approach that involves all the, all the partners in the chain, from inputs to output to market, et cetera, to financing as well. And data shows that over 135,000 smallholder farmers have been reached over the period. This is run in three Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. And it has also resulted in over $30 million of sales of crops from smallholder farmers to commercial buyers. So that's a significant uh, look at that great value chain in total and its impact. If you also look at the HGI, the Africa Green Revolution, which Yara has been, it actually started with Yara, and Yara has been a key part of it. The 10th anniversary was hosted in Ghana last year. In 2018, they introduced the deal room arrangement where we want to move away from the big event to just people coming and talking and going, but actually creating deal rooms that people make deals. And from the report from AGIF in 2019, the deal $200 million of new investments. That's significant if you put that in context. And there were 580 businesses, 37 financial investors, 17 African banks, and three development financial institutions. So these are, I would say, significant dimensions or improvements that has like AGIM that has run for 10 years. And if you talk about also yield growth, and I would take Ghana as a specific example on yield growth. The work, we do a lot of work in, of course, promoting the productivity and yield of farmers in a sustainable way. Some of the work we have done with an institution like USAID Advanced Projects, bringing more of the farmers in groups, giving them best practices, and delivering results. We see in maize, for instance, where some of the farmers we have are able to do six tons per hectare yield, whereas the national average is around two. So that's really three times what the national average is able to do from the streams that we have driven and we have been involved. And, and that means if you go back to 2011, the Ghana's average yield was around 1.5. So there's been some progress if you narrow into the streams. But if I take the bigger Africa context and say, has there been enough progress? My brutal response is no, because the potential in Africa is so big. If we are able to do six tons per hectare with some farmers in Ghana, why is the national average two? You know, it means there's a big potential for the national average to be four, five. You know, I wouldn't even say six, but two is way below. And investments are coming into Africa, yes. But if I go into a great You say the world average is about 5.76 per ton if you take corn to be specific. Brazil is doing 5.5. The Americas, USA is doing 10.5. The EU is doing 7.49. And South Africa and Egypt are good examples in Ghana, in Africa that shows that that is possible. South Africa is doing 5.58 per ton, tons per hectare. Egypt is doing eight. But when you come down to a country like Nigeria, more than 100 million population, huge potential in a Greek, the yield is 1.69 yeah. tons per hectare. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll, so, so, sorry, sorry to butt in, but I just want to, uh, like, I, I want to just leave it there for now because I, I want to get the other perspectives in. But you, you touched on a lot of important issues here, which, which we're going to get back to. And I think. I think you really, you summed it up. You said, I'm gonna be brutally honest. Uh, you know, I, I think you could have been a lot more brutal. There's not enough progress. There is progress, there are examples, but is it, is it adding up? Is it, you know, is it systemic? And I think that's something you've really captured. And uh, on that note, I wanna to turn to, to Ellen. Um, 
I think I think you're the, you're the perfect person for this session because your job role is scalable enterprises. And um, for me, this is one of the biggest questions around agriculture in 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 Africa. Uh, Dunk was just made the point. You can find the examples. You can find the cases of success. Um, but then, how do we go from these examples to structural systemic trends? Um, how do we scale up? That's one of the key issues. So uh, I'd like to to throw that at you. Plus. Yeah, you know, give us a bit of a sense of how Northland approaches agribusiness in Africa. Okay, that was uh, no small question, to put it like that. Um, first and foremost, very happy to be here and to take part in this uh, discussion. Uh, just to say, just a very few words about Northland. So we invest about uh, 3 billion US dollars uh, in developing countries. 16 of these 30 core countries, uh, about, uh, about that, is in Africa. So Africa is a very uh, important uh, market or continent for us. Our mission is to create jobs and improve lives in businesses that drive sustainable development. So really creating jobs and sustainability uh, in all aspects of sustainability is key. If you then talk about, so where, in what sectors do we invest? So about 50% of the money invested is in clean energy. Then you have one third in financial institutions and the remaining is in funds and in agribusiness and manufacturing. So from a, let's say investment or money perspective, uh, it's not, it might not seem to be a huge priority, but it is in fact a huge priority for us. Um, if you look at uh, historically, uh, that means back to June last year, our focus was largely to invest in primary agriculture. Uh, and uh, during the strategy process last year, we changed that to say, let's rather invest in the agribusiness. So investing in uh, food companies, um, we believe we can make a much better change. And we also think that's where maybe we can more easily contribute to driving scalability. Uh, so when we invest in the type of food companies, uh, what we will emphasize a lot when we do uh, the uh, due diligence is to see how do they then source uh, from the smallholder farmers and to what degree do they also have a good um, market access, uh, whether you talk about uh, local markets or whether you talk about export. Um, so why do we think that this shift in looking into the agribusiness and the food chain companies uh, might give, uh, let's say, a better effect than, than uh, the previous uh, strategy that we had? Um, and what we observe, and I think we're not alone in that, in seeing that uh, local markets are growing. So from seeing that the markets were small, so it was actually difficult to get the scalability, we see that that is changing. And also what has been mentioned previously during the plenary session uh, in the morning is that the African Free Trade uh, Agreement is something it's still in the early phase, but I think that is also- Very early phase. I think we have to, we have to remind ourselves. Sorry? I was just saying with the, with the regional, uh, the continental trade agreement, it's very early days. I agree. So that I said it is early days, but you know, it can be uh, some promising uh, uh, opportunities coming up on that. Um, so, but then back to you saying, you know, so we have, uh, you know, very good examples. We continue to see that, uh, you know, investing in, in agribusiness where we think that there are good scalability opportunities. But as you say, will it, do we see signs of that really transforming across uh, the continent on the agribusiness sides? Uh, that will be, you know, stretching it too far. But I do see things that I think, you know, it's important. So just as an example, we have invested in uh, something called Sundry Foods in Nigeria, and they source 90% uh, of their produce from uh, local suppliers. Uh, then I just saw an example, and it might be anecdotal, but I think still it's important that I saw that uh, Carrefour in uh, Cameroon uh, they will source, I think it's more than 50%, maybe as high as, uh, I think it was 70% locally, of which from the, um, within the veggie and, and um, fruits, 50% uh, from local producers. Uh, and a lot of these local producers are also, you know, younger generations uh, coming back and also then establish themselves in this sphere. So it might be anecdotal, but I, you know, it's, true that with the immense challenges, it's easy to kind of say, wow, you know, will we get there? Uh, and that's when I think at least I see from, you know, the responsibility that we have in Norfan, 
uh, we cannot be overwhelmed by that. We have to look for uh, the opportunities and they are there and, uh, and then to grow them. And then in that perspective, I think there are good examples across the continent and in various countries as there are uh, you know, good developments that's happening. Thank you, uh, Ellen. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up on some of those points. I think, so for me, I think an important takeaway there is that if you look a bit closer, there are things happening. And I think this, the point around, uh, there are private companies that are starting to uh, emerge in the, in, in, in the agribusiness space is something that maybe isn't on everyone's radar. And uh, I think a good reference for that is uh, the Africa Agriculture Status Report from last year, 2019, which really looks at the question of, you know, uh, what are private entrepreneurs and private companies in the space doing to address some of these bottlenecks in, in the sector? How successful that is, is debatable. But I agree, that is an important uh, dynamic that is that is unfolding. Uh, Leah, over to you. Um, Tom's is a, uh, I, I, must, I must confess up until uh, pre my prep for the session today, I wasn't familiar with Tom's. I now know that uh, Tom's makes delicious candies and sweets. Um, I imagine uh, sources a lot of uh, its, uh, you know, its, uh, its, its raw material from Africa, especially from West Africa, which of course is the world's biggest cocoa exporter. Uh, you look at sustainability, you look at CSR uh, for Tom's. Give us a little bit of a sense of where Africa fits into the picture for you. Um, and, um, you know, how do we, whenever I hear sustainability, uh, the, I think it's, it, it's such a big topic. It's a, it, it can be a bit difficult to get your head around that. Give us a sense of, in a practical sense, how does sustainability contribute to uh, the solutions to some of the issues we're talking about here? Yeah, it's true. Uh, at some school, we source all our West Africa and cocoa from, from Ghana, actually. Um, but, well, in, in my view, to, to say it straightforward, um, a, a clever integration of sustainability is simply a prerequisite for successful investments and development in, in the sector. Um, one of the things that have hit me when working with sustainable development of the cocoa industry is how the, the farmer communities um, in, for instance, Ghana, are in some way pushed fast forward in through industrialization, through a productivity efficiency development, uh, which in Europe, for instance, took more than 100 years. Um, and, and at the same time, and while they are dealing with uh, the consequences of climate changes too, they are met with uh, rooted in knowledge which uh, the development in Europe did not have to navigate in to the same extent. Um, the farmer communities I have met uh, and which we work with, they are met with expectations of not harming the environment, for instance, with pesticides, not contributing to climate changing by moving forest areas, not using their kids on the farms uh, to all kind of work, just to mention a few. And in a way, it can seem unfair uh, that these communities can't be allowed to develop as unsustainably as many sectors in Europe did, or the states and other places, during the 40s, 15s, up to the 18th, maybe. They are in, in some way burdened, you can say, with knowledge uh, of the consequences of not integrating climate, environmental protection, or respect for human rights, or financial sustainability at farmer level, uh, which were not experienced uh, back then in the same event, uh, amount. But in my view, this can as well be seen as an advantage. It not least has to be handled as an advantage, because in my view, uh, by implementing sustainability in the development journey, that can, if it's done right, be the, or the advantage that is key for success. This is undoubtedly better than after many years having to change old habits and structural and financial conditions uh, that an old sector in the industrialized part of the world has grown up with at, and has become rather dependent on but uh, which are now proving to be unfortunate in the long run. So integrating financial, 
economical and social sustainability in the development is key for successful, profitable, scale driving uh, and development. Uh, we have some knowledge now and a lot of possibilities with technologies and investments and all now which our predecessors have not. Um, so that is not a hindrance for strong development. Uh, it is key for success in the, in the long run. So let us use it cleverly. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Leah. Yeah, Alan, please. Yeah. No, just a quick comment. I, I completely agree, of course. And, and I think the, the key is when you talk about climate change and these things, you know, for the farmers, obviously, the key point when you talk about sustainability is financial sustainability. But sustain, uh, you know, environmental sustainability is very also linked to the, um, to the financial sustainability. So how yes. do we talk about these challenges and how do we get them on board? And I think linking it to the financial and economic uh, you know, sustainability, that's when you can really get their attention. And, and I think with the climate change that we observe now and we live now, and in particular on the, you know, on the African continent with the uh, water challenges, too much or too little and so on, uh, by actually starting to putting money on that. Uh, and then, then I think it's easy to get their attention. That's because then you talk to the key challenge that uh, the farmers are facing uh, every day. Mm -hmm. True. Danko, I wanted to come back to you. Um, Specifically on the question of, of investment and investing. Now, Yara is uh, sold on the idea that Africa is a good place to do business, has been for many years. Uh, Yara has done a lot of work across the continent. So, uh, you know, you, the, the company is practiced in, in the ins and outs of deploying capital in, in African agriculture. Uh, you, I'm, I'm sure you get asked this a lot by, by companies that aren't necessarily investing on the continent. Um, do you think the sector is ready? for you know for meaningful investment is it is it there um do you you know if someone asks you hey we're looking at africa we're not sure should we invest is it an automatic yes or are there still some serious issues that that have to be addressed here like one of the big issues has always been we need more private investment in the sector and like massively more so how do we start to chip away from this you know where, where are some of the bottlenecks I think the Africa agri is prime for investment, but the big challenge is the right investment. You know, agri in Africa needs patient capital. The financial sectors in Africa, I think, have not matured well enough to step out into the agri space properly. So they would rather sit back and invest only in the processing companies, for instance, but those tend not to work because the source of the raw materials for the processing company, which is the farming itself, people are staying away from investing in those places. So you need the right investment to make in Africa to be able to see the impact. Either you do a complete value chain investment or you have value chain partnerships that are committed to invest in the entire value chain. Because if you only invest in the upstream part of the sector, you would quickly be faced with the challenge that the downstream part is not able to support the upstream part of the business. I have seen people who have come and tried to invest in mechanization, for instance and they give a tractor to a smallholder farmer. He doesn't need a tractor, he needs a tractor service. So the investment should come in the space of providing, for instance, mechanized services to a group of smallholder farmers instead of selling tractors to smallholder farmers. So it really comes down to how are investors able to do the real assessment of impact investment. Instead of having a list and having money and putting money in some thing that is just on the list. How many investors realistically, especially international companies, are going to have the patience and are going to be prepared to, to, to do that when it comes to an African context? Um, and are you seeing more it, it, sort of inter-African investment as well? Because, you know, one of the important trends that we are seeing at the moment is just the general emergence of African multinationals as companies that are sort of, you know, branching out, not just across the continent, some, some globally. What's the role of uh, Af you know, private African businesses in, in driving some of this investment? 
Um, that's that's also an area where we have the gap. And and I know people talk about Africa free trade and things. I, I don't want to go there. It's too early. Uh, it's a lot of talk at this stage for me. A lot of people will look to investors from outside Africa, but there's funds in Africa. You know, people people have money in Africa and they go and invest outside Africa. But it's because we are not, as a continent, able to make a Greek attractive. We have turned a Greek into an exploitative exercise, into a way of life for a group of people, because a lot of them are smallholder farmers. We have not managed the drive to create scale out of smallholder farmers to attract the relevant investment and also to encourage Africans to invest in Africa. Because for me, that was what would make a big difference where those who have funds on the continent the need to do the investment to start to change the face of africa that will bring the patient capital you ask how many financial institutions have the patient capital the opportunity is big so if you want to tap into the opportunity that we have here you must have the patience to put that in there you know if, if you want to get into doubling tripling production and booming the uh, agri manufacturing this is the place to be have already reached their peak and, and they are now just managing and stabilizing so if you have the funds then this is the place to be to create transformation that gives you a lot of results or yields out of it or profitability out of that kind of investment staying on the subject of financing and investment but uh, different different side of the question we have to talk about it um it's it's the elephant in the room but you know governments they have to be part of this. I mean, they, they have a critical role to play in, in providing the investment, a lot of the sort of commercially non-viable investment that's needed to get, you know, basics in place and get uh, get these, you know, get the agribusiness sector going. Uh, budget allocations have actually fallen across Africa over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, there was a pledge in, in the early 2000s, I believe it's the Maputo Declaration, um, where they, 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 they committed to sp spending at least 10% of their budgets on agriculture, that's now below two, uh, below three percent. Was actually higher at the start of at the turn of the century. So, so the evidence is governments are investing less rather than more at a time that food insecurity is going up, at a time that climate change is really starting to hit. Um, without that changing, how is any of this? I mean, all of this to me, it's like a pipe dream. I mean, it's a fantasy if if we don't see a meaningful swing in that respect. And it's a general question to to, to all the speakers. But you know, maybe uh, Ellen, I'd like to hear from you on that. I mean, this is so critical. Um, what's the what work is being done there? Uh, you know, and can we can you point to some examples of of countries that are really getting this right? Because if this doesn't fall into place, all of all of this is is hypothetical. Yes, um, that is a good question, and I've been pondering a bit about that. Uh, finding good examples, and to be uh, to be uh, to be honest, I, I must admit that I haven't really found those uh, you know examples that something which is really you know uh, consistently uh, and predictable and good. So you know, if you look at making uh, the agri business work, the whole value chain, you need. You, you need good and predictable uh, regulations, right? Uh, you need an infrastructure that enable you to to move the products either from the field to the processing plant and then all the way through. Uh, you need uh, the the competence. You know, so there's a lot of things you need. And you know, very often what you see is that you know the regulations might be there, uh, you know, a couple of years, and then there are certain changes, and then you have another challenge, and and then suddenly you know you have a, a well-functioning export route, and then there is some uh, uh, challenges on the border and suddenly it doesn't work that well so so I would say that that it's not really I don't have a very good example of something that just works well what I can say what if I look at the various investees that we have where we can see and I think it's quite interesting when COVID-19 hit you know we really said okay brace ourselves uh, this is going to be a bumper road for a lot of the investees and of course it's been extremely challenging but we see also see that many of the um, agribusinesses that we have invested in have been able to manage uh, very hard work, but uh, you know, with strong leadership on top, uh, strong being competent, being uh, you know, uh, quick at uh, adapting, taking down costs, finding the routes to the market, uh, you know, being on top of it. 
you can see that they can really manage through a lot of the changing environment uh, and the and you know the, the lack of the stability that they would like to have in a lot of these uh, uh, key elements that define uh, you know your business environment so uh, if i were to say you know one key thing that we would be looking at that we see is that you know find uh, companies and our businesses that either do have a good leadership on top or that they have the uh, the willingness to to uh, to change and to learn and to adapt uh, for me that is kind of a maybe not revolutionary but still uh, an important observation that, if, uh, that we if, have. if i'm reading correctly between the lines here um is there an element of you know this is going to have to kind of happen without governments in some cases or despite governments which is unfortunately a theme that comes up uh you know too regularly when it comes to you know, development challenges in sub-saharan africa that well success will come despite the government's best efforts to to stop us um and, and Dampo, do you have any thoughts on this? And Leah, uh, you know, if you, if you would like to come in on this. Dampo, specifically, I'd like to ask you, you Ghana has come up a couple of times. Ellen's also mentioned Ghana. And yes, by all accounts right now, Ghana is, is an outlier in terms of uh, getting policies right. It underlines the point that it's possible, right? And this is one of my big frustrations whenever we sit down and we talk about these issues is that it's possible. And we can see where you have people who are committed to the process, it happens. Um, to ask a bit of a big question, perhaps, uh, you know, potentially a little bit generic, but all of this comes back down to the will to just get this stuff done. Um, and I imagine you must get frustrated by this because you must see the potential and how uh, accessible. Yes, um, it's, it's indeed sometimes very frustrating when, like I give examples from the beginning, knowing that it's possible it's being done in some sectors. So the challenge is how, how does it become systemic in the industry? You know, governments come up with policies, very good intent. I have seen some of the government of Ghana policies on a great, you know, the document is extensive. It's end to end, it's value chain, and they're actually doing some good things on them. But you start to say, if you, if you say generally investment in a great is going down, the normal indications are good. If the normal is going up, that's good. But I go deep down into what are the governments investing in? You know, what are the governments investing in? Are they investing in the real impacting areas in a Greek? Or they are investing in the easy big ones? For instance, uh, most of the governments in Africa, including Ghana, run a lot of subsidies. And I know that the international community has put a lot of pressure to say stop the subsidies. But I look around and I say, but Europe is spending $50 billion subsidizing farming. So why is the same Europe telling African government to stop the subsidies? There's a big difference. The, the nature of the subsidy makes the difference. Most of the subsidy programs in Africa is input subsidy. Whereas out there, the subsidy is designed to drive outputs. So I'm a big advocate of saying, okay, Maybe we don't have to stop subsidy, but we have to change the way the subsidy is being used so that it will create a more catalytic approach. If you have, for instance, and if you invest in output-based subsidy, what it means is then you drive the farmers to do the right things with the right yield because the farmer knows that he will get the subsidy when he produces right. Today, the farmer knows that he just needs to farm to get a subsidy. So when he gets the inputs, what actions he takes is almost irrelevant to the farmer. But if, he's, <clears throat> if the subsidies at the end, then the government still invests in subsidies, but in a more catalytic way that creates a sustainable cycle. Because if Europe spends 50 billion on subsidizing farmers, there might be something good in that. The US spends also billions of dollars every year. So that is kind of my thinking around to say, those numbers, if they're coming down, is not a good indicator, but if they can be tuned into the more catalytic areas that would drive the transformation, you could see that sometimes they may even have to spend less to create a bigger transformation than what we are doing. I think that's a, it's a really good illustration of just how pivotal getting the policies, uh, you know, is in, in, in driving this and how even small changes make such a big difference, which to me, 
really adds to the frustration when you look at country after country after country and you just you just sort of you know raise your hands in despair and ask why isn't the government being more effective with this now we we don't have anywhere near enough time to 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 break that down that is a big big topic in its own right i want to cover um yeah, I want to try and end on a on a forward looking note and a hopefully an optimistic note, um, and you know to to ask the question: Well, what's going to what's going to be the game changer here? What is going to be that catalyst that gets us from where we are to to where we need to be? And I don't mean hypothetical. So not like overnight there's a revolution of governance and we wake up and and everything is being done properly. No, realistically, um, where do we look? For the answers here, and uh, you know, one of the themes that uh, I think might be worth speaking to in that context is technology. Technology, yeah, you know, there's a lot of hype around it, but I think no matter how conservative you are, it's obvious that the application of technology will have to be f instrumental in, in in driving a transformation in agriculture on the continent. There are, in principle, tremendous opportunities to apply technology. In reality. How do you deal with things like non-existent infrastructure? You know, technology is just as affected by poor regulation, by a lack of roads, a lack of power, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to put that out there. Is technology an answer, the answer? And what other realistic steps are being taken, need to be taken here, so that we can start to chip away at this mountain of a problem? Because, you know, like everything's a priority. There's money needed everywhere. Uh, you know, like everything's a crisis. Where do we start? Uh, any volunteers for that one? Ellen, please. No, I, I can start off. Um, I must admit, I am kind of a technology optimist, um, and in particular with the, the digital tools. And, and I think there are a number of examples of this. And it's not like it's going to, as you say, it's not going to transform from one year to the other. I mean, it's a longer time, time um, journey. And you know, I, I used to work in, in Yara before joining Norfan and, and they had, you know, a big uh, department working on digital uh, development and tools and so on. And, and I got that very respect for the time it takes to really build strong and, let's say, sustainable tools that are overcome. But what you do see is that the adoption, once you have something out there, is quite fast. And, uh, and one of the topics, you know, we touched upon uh, several times, also the, you know, the old, the youth, the younger generations in Africa. And, you know, for them, agriculture and having seen how their forefathers and everything have been been working very hard is not may, maybe tempting to to uh, to go into agriculture. But actually, I do think that the digitalization as such and the opportunities uh, that that gives to access to knowledge, to doing the right things, can be actually one factor that also attracts and retains uh, younger people uh, in the uh, uh, in the agriculture space. So, uh, so and, and what is key here, obviously, is how to get the accurate information about the weather, how to get the accurate advice about when to sow and when to apply the fertilizers and when to harvest and so on. And, and this is not, you know, complicated stuff and, uh, because you can do it, you know, you, it's very easy to adapt to the local languages. Uh, you don't have to have, it can be spoken, it can be drawings or, or pictures or films. So there's a lot of way where you can actually get through the knowledge in various ways. So uh, from that perspective, I'm, I'm, I, I do think that this uh, the technology is one of these elements uh, that can really make a change. Just one one additional point on that. And, uh, just you know, we talked about, and I saw one of the the comments here on the side uh, on the on the chat here about uh, you know all the food loss and waste, and that's also combining then you know the solar power. Uh, then you have the fridge, uh, and then you can have the digital tools that you know you can then rent for ten cents per day, small place in that fridge, so that you can you know it doesn't uh, you know the food can last instead of two days, maybe fourteen days. So you know there's a lot of things happening. Combining these different things and the Internet of Things, I think that this can be a very important drive. Has uh, started on an optimistic note, uh, Leah and. But do you agree, disagree? Uh, do you want yes. to add or subtract? Yes, I have to agree with you, Ellen. Yeah. Technology is one of the very, very important keys for, for a good development. And, and not least the collaboration, not uh, only on technology development, but also that we need to develop cross uh, cross sector and also with the governments. That's highly important. 
because uh, what I see is that, that, that many different private companies, they develop their own to be, to be first or have the, the best and, and they uh, invest in the same pharma communities, for instance, because uh, some pharma communities is easier to work with than, than others, more developed, more accessible. Um, and and uh, we need to collaborate uh, in, uh, yeah, across the whole industry to come across that and to get the development going faster. And I see that in the cocoa industry, uh, a, a lot of good examples uh, of that. Uh, well, Cocoa Foundation, uh, International Cocoa Initiative, uh, or the latest one, uh, uh, Cocoa and Forest Initiative. I don't know if you have heard about that, but, but all the big chocolate and cocoa manufacturers in, in the world have got, uh, joined forces also together with the, the governments of, of Ivory Coast and Ghana. And, and that is uh, the kind of uh, initiatives that uh, really can uh, be a game changer, in my view, uh, to, to develop also technology and, and, and other solutions to, to the issues we are all meeting. We have just to, I think we, we have to uh, forget the, the normal uh, competitive lens landscape when we talk about these things, things and uh, joint forces. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the key. And, and as Ellen mentioned uh, too, education, uh, technology can help on, on that. But in general, education is so much a, a key for, for development. Dankwa, where do you see okay. the potential for yeah. this to, to really shift? Yeah, I, I will bring a slightly different perspective here. So there's, there's the substantial smallholder, individualized smallholder farming places a scoping limitation on technology, on real transformative technology. Because the guy doing two acres, three acres, four acres would not find much value when you talk about compounds. This is just a basic technology, right? So what we need to do, which is very practical, is to create scale out of the smallholder farmers. And how do you do that? Consolidation and aggregation of smallholder farmers. And also policies, most of the policies you see across Africa are focused on smallholder farming. We need more policies that drive large scale farming. When you have the scale, technology becomes an automatic acceptance. So if you don't build the scale and you throw in technology, it will not work in the way that you expect to get a transformation. So you need to, to generate that skill first. And then the market linkages, which is mostly also missing in many uh, countries. If the market linkages are there, you know, you have a complete value chain approach. You don't need to tell the farmer that now you need to have a combined harvester because you have a big market and you have a big farm size and the harvesting will be faster and more efficient to serve your market. Today, I know we have a customer who has a tractor packed in the shop for the whole year because you know he had some aid technology and he got cheap tractor. The tractor breaks down, he can't manage it. So you need to do the technology in, in a different way. You need to build the scale base that attracts the technology. Then all these other things of climate information, when to farm, the rainfall, starts to fall in place. Otherwise, the two acre, three acre farmer really doesn't follow when the rain is falling. He, he acts when the rain falls. But if there are 100 farmers doing 1,000 acres, for instance, then you talk to the group, and the group appreciates that this is good for us. And then they will run onto the technology bit. And of course, also, technology is not cheap, so the financing, and the credit to go into that space becomes an important part that needs to be looked at. Dakwa, I, I agree with you fully that scale is, is key here. Uh, you said you have to drive scale, you have to bring the farms together. Who is the you in this equation? The players in the value chain. Yara, for instance, we, we, we sell fertilizer, but we are critically involved in creating scale and aggregation of farmer groups. Today, I'm sitting in the northern region in a program called Pre-Harvest. And it's built up of a project we worked on with the USAID for the last 10 years. And we had testimonies of farmers who said, today I have 1,000 outgrowers in my scheme. 
those thousand farmer outgrowers were individual farmers 10 years ago. So now there's a consolidator who has brought them together and is really benefiting from the high-end technology, access to finance, because the banks see him as a thousand smallholder farmer, not as, a, as, not as one individual farmer. So he's attracting credit. We had one who says, I got my market in UK from a forum like this. So the market linkages, so we are driving that. It is not, we don't have to leave it to the government. The government, of course, has to use policy to steer and support some of these drives. But the private sector cannot sit back and fold their arms and expect that the government is coming to call you and call the farm and bring you together. Mm -hmm. We are in business. And the sustainability of our business depends on the sustainability of their great value chain. If the farmers are not sustainable, I can't sell my fertilizer. And I'm sure if the farmers are not sustainable, the Nestle's and the Unilever that are processing cannot get the inputs to produce. Uh, so private sector needs to come together to do this. Ellen, you want to come in on this? Yeah, no, uh, I completely agree with what uh, what Tankwa is saying. And, and uh, you know, examples we have is that, you know, companies we have invested in that, that buy from, let's say, 10,000 dairy farmers, uh, as an example. And, and you know, when you look at that type of, of impact, and, and of course, they again, this these dairy will be uh, dependent on the quality of the milk. So they need to make sure that the farmers that are then having the various uh, uh, cattle, that they, um, you know, use the right technology that they they the hygienic and the way they feed the cows and and so through that you have a very good way of actually then uh channeling out uh, technologies uh, competence etc also through uh digitalization or digital tools we have two minutes left so um opportunity for some final quick comments otherwise i'm going to wrap up um so that we can finish on time and go grab some Go grab some coffee. Any final thoughts? Maybe just a, a quick yeah. call to, to integrate the the what can I say the youth in the solution <clears throat> because what we experience at Sunproof is that that by uh, putting some focus on, on the youth, their uh, education and, and to support them to be ambassadors of, of change that is just so important for the small farming communities. Because what what should the the young people do if they are, for instance, four siblings in in the family? They cannot uh, crop their parents' uh, farm in in four and 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 then uh, earn enough from from that. So what what we see is that that we need to integrate them in in uh, in our solutions and and to to support and and to educate them to uh, to. Um, Innovate business ventures uh, locally and uh, and to, uh, to to stay in in the local communities because they are needed there uh, and um, and uh, yeah they are just so important to to continuing the the positive uh, development that we can see uh, actually is possible to start. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, guys. Uh, it's stating the obvious to say that uh, there's a lot more to this topic than we've than we've discussed. Uh, Fifty minutes is not a long time to uh, figure out the ins and outs of what's working and what's not with African agribusiness. But uh, the seriousness of the you know the task at hand really should it can't be underestimated. I mean, this is in many ways one of the most important things that has to be fixed, uh, not just for the sake of food security, but uh, agriculture is potentially hugely significant for employment. Uh, it's, it accounts for a huge chunk of GDP across sub-Saharan Africa. And without a, a, a properly growing, thriving agriculture sector, a lot of the uh, potential we talk about, about Africa's future, and a lot of what the continent undoubtedly could do on the world stage really to me becomes hypothetical. And um, you know, this year has really been a, a, very, a very harsh reminder that um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to start matching action with rhetoric much better. And that has, has obviously come through this morning that there are examples, there's plenty of promise, we, you know, there are plenty of good people, they're, they're, but we're not, it's not syncing up, it's not connecting. Um, all I can say, all we can say on that is, um, you know, let's hope that that changes. Uh, let's hope that those, you know, those, those dots do start to connect because 
something that I think a lot of people underestimate is the need for urgency in, in, moving, in moving this forward. And here too, the pandemic, I think, has been a, a sort of a slap in the face, slap across the face type wake up call of like, you don't have forever. You can't just sit around forever and talk about this. Now, no doubt um, we will you know, we'll continue to discuss this and uh, we'll see how the pandemic continues to affect uh, food security and agribusiness. Uh, fingers crossed that we move in the, the right direction, but I will say I remain on the skeptical end until I see the evidence. On which note, thank you very much to everyone in chat. Um, thank you very much to uh, Ellen, Dunqua and Leah for this morning's discussion and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. See you guys. Thank you.